All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the We Be Free Radio Show, Brain Food from the Heartland. One of my favorite human beings in the world returns to the show, Dr. Richard Bandler. Doc, delighted and honored to have you back. It's always a pleasure, Louis. Um, you're one of the few radio people that I do frequently. I and I'm honored, truly. I, I'm honored. I I um, I was. I, um, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here in Orlando. That, that that explains the mediocre art behind me. Uh, I'm in a hotel <laughs> suite, and uh, the uh, but you have had a bunch of my crew on this week. I, I yeah, agree. and continuing and continuing. Juan is coming on. I think um, I've got to grab my schedule. I I love having your people, uh, NLP people. Well, it's, it's always one of those times where a lot of really bright people come together. We do this twice a year, really uh, three different seminars in a row. Uh, we had a persuasion engineering workshop. I just finished a neurohypnotic repatterning workshop, which was went really, really well. And uh, then we have a public speaking workshop next week. And uh, where we train people to use their voice elegantly and be able to influence audiences. Uh, so it's a bunch of different kinds of workshops, lots of great people. A lot of my trainers came in for this and I have, you know, have institutes in almost every country around the world. Wow. Um, although I haven't heard from the Russian one recently. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's, you know, when, well, I want to go back uh, about NLP and you with NLP. I've got to tell you, and I've been saying this about your new book, Patterns for Problem Solving, The New Structure of Magic. And I'm, I'm going to get into that, Dr. Bandler, in just a couple of minutes. But, and it, you write about, take us all the way back, if you would. I ask you this frequently, to the very early days of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Well, in the early days, uh, when it first started, basically, there were psychotherapists who would get results and, and most of them didn't. Uh, whether they were psychiatrists, counselors, it really didn't matter. There were a few really wonderful people uh, like Virginia Satir, Fritz Perls, um, Milton Erickson, who, who actually got some results. And people would look at them and they'd go, oh, they're intuitive, they're this, they're that. And to me, as a mathematician, their behavior appeared very rule-governed, just like language is. Even if people are not a grammarian, they know what a well-formed sentence of theirs is. It's based on our neurology. So uh, I began originally with John Grinder to model what these people did, that is build mathematics behind it so it could be explained, simplified, and taught so that uh, people could acquire magical skills. And we stumbled across all kinds of things. We began then modeling people who had gotten over things like phobias and, uh, you know, so that we could teach somebody how to, how, to, how to think on purpose in a certain set of steps and disappear a phobia in 20 minutes or, you know, reduce anxiety or motivate themselves more. Then we began modeling with successful salespeople, successful negotiators. I worked with the government on all kinds of negotiating projects on skills like, uh, uh, you know, shooting a gun and uh, doing sonar and stuff to make the things where people seem to have a talent. But talent is just a word that says we don't know how it works. If you think more like somebody who does something talented, you'll be more talented. Uh, we did a project with education where we found out that good spellers make big pictures of words and uh, poor spellers have a tendency to sound them out like they're told to in school. And when you look at a word and you make a picture of it and then you make the letters big and you look at the letters forward and backwards and memorize it and pull that picture back, it's easy to copy down. And we were able to up the, you know, take educationally handicapped kids and get them not to be educationally handicapped anymore by focusing on the task. Uh, so in the field of psychotherapy, the field of business, all kinds of different things. We've worked with athletes to improve their skill. Uh, this year alone, I seem to have had a flood of uh, baseball players that kind of slumped during the coronavirus and uh, managed to get them to rethink like they did on their best day rather than their worst day. 
and up their skill level. Uh, so I've been a coach for major league athletes. I've worked with the military. I've done just about everything for over 50 years now. I've been doing this. Knowing those successes and being able to train people to, how has that felt for you? Amazing. You think about all the things, half a century. How does that feel for you today? Busy. <laughs> <laughs> very, very busy. Yeah, I'm very happy with what I've accomplished, but I don't, I don't think backwards. I'm a, I'm a what's next guy. <laughs> when you th I think about... A, Again, being able to do these, I do want to talk about you being in, in Florida, being in Orlando. And I, I saw some of uh, your trainers that were coming from the UK, et cetera, that were very, everybody's very excited to be able to get together. Uh, it was difficult, even, even with the technology during uh, the height, I'll say, of the coronavirus, when people couldn't get together. Thankfully, the technology has allowed people to see and communicate with each other. Yet, what was that like? What was, what's it like being in Orlando now? Well, I'm just grateful to have live human beings in front of me. Uh, to me, you know, Zoom is a little bit like talking to somebody through the window. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you teach audiences, uh, having, you know, uh, 100 to 15,000 little miniature pictures on the screen <laughs> is just not the same Doesn't as getting into a room and feeling their energy and influencing and seeing their excitement and all of that kind of stuff, you know, and... and and it's difficult online to demonstrate things. I'm, I'm a person that brings people on the stage and demonstrates. I want to show people how this is done so that, you know, they, and then have them go do it and then come back and tell me how they did so we can tweak it so they can do better. Uh, part of the reason all these trainers come is so that the participants in my seminars get individualized help. Uh, trainers get bet get better at what they're doing. My assistants get better at what they're doing, and the people in the audience get more personal attention and learn skills that they wouldn't learn otherwise. Uh, yes. That's what makes these live events so great. And uh, COVID put a real damper on that. I have to admit, um, I'm real happy to have live human beings in front of me again. And and I could really tell this, you know, uh, after all this time of uh, you know. Uh, of, of, you know, because I've tried everything. We tried bringing 10 people and having them sit three people apart wow. and, and, and then broadcasting to 500 people in Italy. And uh, so I at least had people to demonstrate from. We broadcast from Universal Studios and, uh, and it was better than nothing, but it's just not the same thing as, you know, live interactions with human beings so that you see the audience respond. And I mean, they set up all these screens so I could see little pictures of people responding, but it's not the same no, thing. You know, the, you know, some things, some things are much better in person and you know, that's real life and I like real life. As do I, I'm talking with Dr. Richard Bandler. We've got lots of links up and you can find pure NLP, richardbandler.com, et cetera. We are going to be talking in just a couple of minutes. I said that before, right? Patterns for Problem Solving, the new book, The New Structure of Magic. And I see that uh, Kay Cook is with us. And I, I just love Kay. I want to say hi to, to Kay. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about the tipping point, if you will, for this book, Dr. Bandler, the, um, for you writing it. Because this goes way back. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. The, the tipping point for you, that that when you said, you know what, I'm going to write this, I'm going to do this with the, and I I love how you did it with the, it's it's an older book that you've updated. Yeah, in 1975, I released a book that was about language and therapy, and John Grinder and I built a model called the Meta Model, which is something that allows you to uh, have be able to ask questions. Uh, that 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 lead to solving problems as a question as opposed to questions that explain why you have a problem or where your problem came from or or help you to categorize a problem it leads people to through their thought processes to begin to find solutions and uh, at the time we were we were finding out what what good questioners did for the purpose of therapy. So it was a book about language and therapy. 
as the years have gone by, I've come to realize that that model itself, and we've refined it over the years, uh, serves as a really good tool for problem solving. So I decided to redo the book and make it about problem solving. And Owen Fitzpatrick and I got together and changed the examples and changed the order and the nature of the model and tweaked everything so that uh, you can understand how it works. And, uh, and if you practice it, you get really good at solving problems. Uh, we've been teaching people this for a long, long time. And if you, know, if you don't ask good questions, you don't get good answers. If you ask, you know, why is this problem here? You understand how to make it again. And uh, if, you, if you ask questions like what would happen if I did and what stops me and you begin to gather a different kinds of information. Uh, you know, the first time I had a depressive and they came in and I looked at them and I said, how do you know you're depressed, right? And the person goes, well, I just feel depressed. And I said, where? And they told me I felt cased in cement in my head. And I literally bopped them in the head and said, break it up, you know? And, <laughs> and, and oddly enough, you know, the, uh, that was enough to get persons started on the road. And then you ask the question, you know, what aren't they doing? And most of the press are thinking thoughts that make them happy. You know, they don't go through their history looking for good events. They, they look at the events that happen and distort them into things that feel bad. They go, they always say at the time I thought I was happy, but now that I think about it and to have a machine that constantly depresses you, it's just not useful. You, you need a cheerful machine. And so that you're not going to find that in a depressive. You go and talk to a cheerful person, find out how they think about it and teach the other person to think more like the successful thinker. This book is all about changing the way you think because it changes the way you feel and therefore changes what you can do. And again, written very directly. I've said this uh, uh, before about this book and talking about you coming on today, Dr. Bandler, very directly written for, for everyone. Uh, I'm not a lot of terminology that people are going to have to look up. And one of the things that, and I've said this before about, I love reading nonfiction. I, be over my level of education sometimes uh, or frequently and i'm looking up things and back and kind of doesn't do well for the flow of the book this book flows and people can learn and learn directly and immediately uh yeah actually this book has in uh, bibliography uh qr codes that you can go to and i explain any ter terminology uh with a little video so that because I don't think terminology makes you smarter. I, uh, terminology is, is, is a shorthand, basically. And uh, some academic fields have snobby shorthand. And I try to avoid that because, uh, you know, th this is my 34th book. Uh, although two, you know, I have a couple of fiction books out. I have some fairy tales and other things, but I have some academic books that then I discovered the ones that are over people's heads don't really become helpful. And, uh, you know, I wrote some books with some people that uh, I think could mostly be served as a sedative instead of a book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I stopped doing that a long time ago, probably 45 years ago, and started writing my books so that, you know, they're as useful to a taxi cab driver as they are to a psychiatrist or the CEO of a major corporation. Um, when I wrote the book, Get the Life You Wanted, I wanted to be written at the level of a cake book so that people could thumb through it, pick out the thing they wanted, you know, whether it was less fear, less anxiety, or more motivation, so that it's broken into three pieces, get, get you know, getting over things, getting through things, and getting to things. And, and I try to keep all my books so that they're useful to the end user, that, that training professionals to help people is all well and good. But I want, you know, my goal was to make the end user going to therapy for five years and getting nowhere, uh, you know, 50 years ago seemed to me the wrong thing. But, you know, people should be able to come in and walk out different. And uh, that, you know, if you brought your car in and it was making a certain noise and they said, well, you had to bring it back once a week 
for five years and then we'll talk about it. Uh, you wouldn't accept that. And I certainly don't think you should do that with your brain and your emotions. And you know, the currency of your whole life is how you spend your time. So all of my stuff is designed to get stuff done quickly. Solve your problem and move on. And this book is a set of tools that help people solve their problem and get on with it. Yeah, for I, I am going to say for people that want to solve their problems and, and get on with it, they're like you say, Dr. Bandler, I know there are those that choose to wallow in things. This is for people that want to get yeah. better. Not, yeah. If not I want to get sleep, sleep, I'll write a book for them, the wallowers. And, uh, <laughs> this is how to wallow for years and years and make everyone around you suffer. Miserable, yeah. Frustrate your friends and relatives, it's going to be called. <laughs> Love that. You should. That would that would be great, Doctor Van. The structure of extended stupidity. <laughs> oh, that that would that would be great. Uh, maybe it's what do they call it uh, now? Graphic novels or something. When you you write about the structure of choice in your chapter one, of course you know me well enough. I don't go chapter one this and chapter two, but I love that you had the bold text indicating the 2022 and the non-bold text going back to 1975, which, which I love in the book. You got the original text and then the newer text. I want to say updated. I don't know what word to use exactly. You do updated. I guess that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, uh, when it's, some of the text is is from the original edition and it was fine the way it is and still is. Uh, some things needed changing and I wanted to point out what those were. Um, that book has been around since 1975 and it still sells, uh, you know, that they had them on the table downstairs, people are still buying them. And uh, even with the new book out, some people are buying the old one, but I was trying to save people the trouble since the publishing company doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, the owner of the publishing company turned 100, passed away, and, wow. and they returned all the books to the authors uh, rather than somebody buying the company. So uh, that's how I started redoing a lot of these books. Is I got back 12 titles from uh, three different companies, primarily as a result of COVID. Oh. God, it's, again, the book is available everywhere and everywhere online. Amazon has it. Amazon will be uh, quick with it. Uh, don't forget those independent booksellers. They can order them also. Again, the name of the book, Patterns for Problem Solving, The New Structure of Magic. My guest, the author, Dr. Richard Bandler with Owen Fitzpatrick. And Owen's been on. Is Owen there, by the way? No, no, Owen is not here. But lots are. And I know it's got to be a wonderful reunion. I saw some pictures, by the way, of the, oh God, what was it? The, the hippie, hippie party? Oh, the, uh, yeah, hippie gnosis party. Hippie gnosis, that was it, yeah. Yeah, at, at night, we, sometimes, we, we, sometimes we have a movie night and we show films of Milton Erickson and Virginia and Fritz, you know, the old timers to show where the stuff came from, serve popcorn, uh, th this time they had every, they had most of my staff and trainers dressed up as hippies and flashing lights and, and a dance floor and everybody was dancing, let their hair down a little bit, you know, uh, it looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, when we, uh, do design human engineering, we'll, we'll have scientific parties and, and people wear lab coats and, you know, we pass out beakers of booze. Um, so and that sounds good too. <laughs> yeah. well, you got to have a little fun. If you don't enjoy what you do, then it's just going to make you not want to do it. And yeah. so we try to have a little fun along the way, but yeah, that, 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 that it's kind of shocking to people that walk through because it's, you know, we have all the conference rooms in the hotel. So a lot of people have to park in the lot and walk through the foyer and all these parties, of course, leak out into the foyer. And you can see the very straight people coming through and there'll be, you know, people with giant long hair and beads and, you know, brandy glasses and, <laughs> blues, you know, walking back and forth. And it's kind of a flashback to the 60s. Yeah, sounds like fun to me. What do you know about? 
<laughs> yes, I know about very, very, very well, Dr. Bandler. Uh, you talk about, if you would, some of the structures, uh, the structure of problems, some, not to over well, focus on problems, but. You have to understand <laughs> the universe provides everything that most of our understanding of problems is that it, it's the, the, the way that people think about something that creates the difficulty that the difficulty itself isn't, isn't in the nature of the world. It, you know, when, when people come into me and they go, we, we don't see any way that something can be done. They're correct, they don't, but it doesn't mean it can't be seen. It doesn't mean it can't be found. And if you don't change, if you don't have flexibility of thought, then you can't find solutions. Uh, I sort of break it down into four categories. There are things you want, that you don't have. There are, you know, there are, are things you have that you don't want, like fears, you know, uh, or, you know, or, or where your costs are too high for a product, uh, or, or arguments with your wife. And, and, and when people tell me that they can't stop arguing with their wife, one of the things they haven't thought about doing is stopping. And that's because they get a set of feelings and they compulsively start opening their mouth. And so you have to learn how to change the way you feel when somebody does something to break that cycle. Uh, even in scientific experiments, I've worked with R&D companies where we go in and they're trying to break through a technological problem. And they, the way they think about it limits them. You know, when, when, you, when you ask them what stops them from doing something, they'll come up with a list of things where really they can go to the rest of the scientific community and find out. One time they were trying to make a full color hologram and they kept saying it was impossible. And, and the, the, one of, what stopped them was there was no read-write film. And it turned out there was a company called Plessy that made read-write film. And so it, it, it was just that sometimes they don't look outside of their own domain and their own knowledge to find out who has the answer. And uh, sometimes you have to change the way you feel to become excited and curious enough to look for an answer. And sometimes to break bad behaviors, you have to change the way you feel about what somebody else does. And I know with all this woke technology that if we have a bad feeling, the whole world is supposed to stop doing something so that we feel bad. But the world is not terribly cooperative and it just doesn't work. And, uh, you know, it creates division, it creates animosity. Uh, you know, the, act, the fact that, you know, that, that this cancel culture exists, now they're trying to get comedians to stop being funny because they might hurt somebody's feelings. You know, I remember Lenny Bruce offending everybody in a club. And, uh, it, you know, it really it served, I think, as an opportunity for people to loosen up and not be so uptight. And uh, this, it's one thing the world needs to learn to do, it's to be more tolerant and relaxed. Uh, you know, if you want diversity, you have to be open to it. You can't select what diversity is okay and what diversity is not okay. And uh, if you don't like the way you feel, you should need to learn to change it and instead of use it as a way to be hateful uh, because that, that kind of stress is gonna kill you. I wrote another book called The Secrets of Happy Yes, which makes the distinction between, you know, medical science knew that stress makes you sick, makes you kill, you know, they're talking about uh, uh, inflammation as being the cause of a lot of cancers and all kinds of things. But on the other side, they've also done tremendous research, which proves that the happier you are, the more likely you are to get over illness, the more likely you are to be resistant to illness, the faster you will recover from surgery. And we documented all of that and then put exercises in a book for people to learn to change their attitude and live happier. It turns out those secrets, there are five big things that help people. You know, one is having a purpose. And we took extreme cases. We took people who had been in concentration camps and got out and ended up being happy and productive in their life. We took people who had, who had been prisoners of war and you know, for eight years and had been beaten and came back and don't worry about it anymore. 
And all of those people in those horrible situations imagined what they were going to do when they were free. Now, we're already free, so we should be able to imagine and make great plans and have a purpose in them. And if we have a purpose to our life, if we have good friends, good relationships, all of these things, and they are buildable. So we put down specific ways for people to change their thinking so that these things became more a part of their life. Uh, that book has just been re-released as well. It was out of print for three or four years because the publishing company went down. And so The Secrets of Happy is back. Oh, that's wonderful. I get a link up to that also. I'm talking with Dr. Richard Bandler. When, that, when people, we were talking about Waller, and I don't want to focus on much on Wallowers, but there's, there's ways if people really want to feel better, how they look at things, how they perceive things, how they take, um, how do I want to say this, not positive news, a diagnosis or whatever, and deal with it. All, all the time. You know, uh, doctors are required uh, in America to tell you the worst of all alternatives. So when, you know, when they tell you things, you know, they, they say things which in and of themselves are relatively silly because you can never underestimate the human being's ability to, to live and to heal themselves and to get over illness and all kinds of things. There, you know, there are so many cases of people being told that they had six months to live and living 10 years, you know, it, it's, but doctors are required because there's a law called informed consent, where they even have to, if they give you a drug, tell you the possible side effects. And, and you have to have a filter in your brain. You know, they told me once, you know, that one of the side effects of the drug they were going to take was going to make me impotent. And I said, what's the percentage on that? And they said, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, about 60%. And I said, which way 60%? And they said, well, it's 60% likely. And I said, good, that leaves me 40%, you know, because I'm going to be in the 40%. I like that side better. And, you know, they told me once that I wouldn't walk again. And, uh, and if I hadn't have tried, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to walk. I don't walk perfectly, but at least I can walk. I walk now without a cane or crutches or anything. And, uh, you know, when you believe you can do something, human beings will always surprise. And it's not the doctor's fault. It's the way they've been trained. And, you know, and they're, they're required. But we as human beings can make independent choices. And our level of belief, our level of, in, of things, and, and these are malleable. When, when you have bad ideas in your head, typically they're too big. You have big pictures in your head. Even people who have bad memories, they don't come in and they'll go, I think about this every day, you know? Yeah. And I, I ask them, I go, I go, how often? And they go, oh, on and off all day, two minutes here, one minute there, three minutes here. Uh, you know, when I lay in bed at night and I'll go, do, do you think it adds up to an hour? Do you think it adds up to two hours? What do you think? And they'll go, well, maybe an hour. And I'll go, well, that's 365 hours in a year, 3,650 in 10 years. In 40 years, if you're planning to live 40 years, we're talking about just this one thought consuming over 10,000 hours. Does that sound like a good plan? Then I'll tell them to put a border around it. And they always go, what? I go, does your picture have a border? It's bad memory. And when they go, uh, they go, well, no, I will go, okay, put a border, pick your favorite color, put a two inch border all the way around the outside. Now, the minute you do that, you're using a different part of your brain. It's not the part that remembers, it's the part that constructs. And when you take this picture of a memory and you put it over here and you put a border around it, then I'll have them shrink it down to the size of a quarter and turn it black and white this fast and then wait a few minutes and I'll tell them now think about it and they'll go I'm having trouble remembering it right now go but you can remember it and they go yeah and I go does it feel bad and they'll go no now this is a neurological trick not a psychological trick but if you can go through 
Now they have 12,000 extra hours to do good stuff, right? So I then put something else in its place, like starting to see themselves being somebody who can accomplish what appears impossible. Because when you start doing things that you'd never believed you could, right? Just little things like changing the pictures in your head, making them bigger or smaller, taking your desires and making them bigger, you know, making movies that are good stuff and de deleting the movies of bad stuff. When you start editing your brain, you know, we clean our house and our cupboards and some of us are walls. <laughs> <laughs> that was a shot. I got it. Rich, Dr. Van. No, I'm just on your wife's side. That's all. Uh, <laughs> You told me the story about your wife going, keep your clutter in your office. Yeah, <laughs> and it is. <laughs> but but if people people clean the kitchen table, but not, sometimes they don't clean up their mind. They don't go through and realize that you can move pictures here and there. You can build bigger and stronger beliefs. You can get rid of bad beliefs. And all of that technology is laid out in my books in a simple way so that people can do a little, do a little, be your own producer and editor so that you can begin to change the way you think and therefore it'll change how you actually feel about things. And therefore it changes what you're actually able and capable of doing, uh, you know, controlling bad habits, uh, you know, spending, you know, the amount of time that a depressive or an anxious person spends doing it is enormous. And if they spent all of that time doing fun things and being productive, their life just gets better. And, uh, you know, I'm the guy that doesn't care where your problems came from, because the best thing about the past is that it's over. over. Yay, the best I love thing that. about the future is you can do whatever you want with it. I'm talking with Dr. Richard Bandler. When uh, I remember in one of the early times, I don't know how many, a decade and a half ago, maybe when you were on and we we're talking about the about spinning and, and shrinking uh, make you go backwards, et cetera. And I remember somebody had, uh, I remember if they called in after the show, they said it sounded too easy. And I said, well, why don't you get one of the books and, and, and try it? I'm just remembering this. And she had said, it is easy. Uh, later, later on, after she got the book and read it, 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 it is that easy. It, they, it's sometimes people have gotten so into those or living those problems so much, it, it seems almost too simplistic or too easy. So why wouldn't you try? Why wouldn't you try something easy? There is no reason. Uh, most of the people that come to me have spent years trying everything that uh, my clientele all came from psychiatrists and psychologists and people and they were all people that had been through everything, every kind of therapy, uh, you know, everything from vitamin treatments to electric shock, uh, everything you could think of. Uh, I've had CEOs that came in, you know, that had problems with their companies that, you know, they'd hired all kinds of consultants and everything. And sometimes I just have them switch some pictures around in their head and their brain goes, oh, oh. <laughs> because you know, it's, it's a miraculous tool if you understand how neurology works, that when you take bad memories and you shrink them down and you run them backwards, right, be it ever so microscopic, the neurocortical pathways move through the billions of neural nets uh, by size. And when you go backwards, it changes the charge in those and they don't fly forward so this doesn't automatically make you feel bad. This doesn't automatically make you feel overwhelmed. This doesn't automatically make you feel stuck so you can't get to conclusions. And when you sort of weed away some of this nonsense, that's just good learning patterns. It's just that what you learned doesn't work. We learn a lot of things that work and some things that don't work. And when people dwell upon nonsense from the past, they're, they're, they're depriving themselves of using the wonderful magical mystery that is our brain. Millions and billions of neural cortical pathways and, you know, and, 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 and neurons, as many as there are stars in the sky, each talking to 10 to 100 others. The combinations are limitless. 
And if we don't explore a little bit and experiment a little bit, then of course we're stuck. Uh, that's how people, and then people get stubborn about it as well. And when they try something that affects them, and you know, especially something simple like that, it opens up, it, they start to go, well, if I can do this, what else can I do? Rather than I can't do this, so I'll never try. Talking with Dr. Richard Bandler, uh, somebody emailed me about the, the uh, they saw you on uh, on TV with the, the snakes and the spiders with- uh, Michael Strahan. Michael Strahan, yeah. yeah. That's something you've done for decades, correct? Correct, yeah, well, he was terrified of snakes. And uh, and so the producers, they called me up. It was funny. They called me on the phone and uh, or they'd actually didn't call me. They called my publisher and the publisher called me and I called the producer. And his question was, when are you going to be in the United States? And I said, I live in the United <laughs> States. Who is more American than me? You know, uh, and, and he goes, well, you know, we're we're spending a week where, you know, we're where we're presenting these challenges and Michael Strahan is afraid of snakes. And, you know, and so I flew out to New York and uh, while the show is going on, I'm sitting in the back and they kept coming in and going, uh, well, you know, we said we were gonna give you 15 minutes, but you're, you know, we're running late. You're, you, uh, can you do it in 10? And then it was, can you do it in seven, right? And, and then they said, you're gonna have to come back. And I said, I'm not coming back. I said, I flew all the way out here. I said, just bring me out and give me a couple minutes. And uh, so uh, I got to use the time during the commercial, but I got a couple of minutes and Michael was then holding a big snake. And uh, uh, oddly enough, uh, the, uh, the next morning he came out and he said, I wanna tell you people, he said a lot of people thought that it was pretend that he had acted as oh. if he was afraid of snakes and then held a snake. And he'd said, I want to tell everybody, he goes, this was real. And if you looked at him, it was it. They showed clips of, uh, of her scaring the crap out of him with rubber snakes. And uh, he, was, he was very afraid and he had no desire to do this. The only reason he did it is the producers made him. But once he went through it in his mind, he went over and held a stake. And nobody was more surprised than he was that, you know, as he's holding that stake and Kelly's got the head and he's got the rest of the body. And then he finally picked it all up by himself. And uh, it, that's, it's on YouTube. You just go Michael Strand's sure. Snakes and it pops up. It's also on my webpage, richardbandler.com. There's a link to it. Uh, that it's just an example of how quickly people can get rid of a fear because the fear doesn't come from the snake. The fear comes from learning to be afraid of snakes. So he was afraid of the idea of snakes. And when you change the idea, then your body responds differently. And whether it's snakes or heights or anything else that, you know, bees, uh, you know, I've got people who are, after COVID, I've been working with a lot of agoraphobics, especially oh. on Zoom, because they don't want to leave their house. There are some people that just are afraid to go outside now. People are, have gotten uncomfortable about talking to each other face to face. Uh, it hasn't been good for our children at all. No. Uh, you know, they didn't learn to be social animals and we are social animals. Um, and, you know, th this, this overreaction by the government, as it turns out, you know, I got the COVID shots and still got COVID twice. So uh, I'm not impressed with their vaccine. You know, I had to get it so that I could fly places. But, uh, you know, it, it wasn't all it was promised to be. And there are ways of treating COVID, especially now we have even more of them. And, you know, uh, there are going to be flus and vaccines and all kinds of things in the world. The best thing to do is to have a good immune system and, and have good doctors ready and waiting. Everybody should have a doctor they like and trust. And if you don't like and trust your doctor, look around. There are plenty of them. I uh, I, I agree with you 100%. There are plenty of them. And fortunately, I found a very, very good one about a year ago. It's absolutely a little over a year ago. And she's absolutely uh, amazing because a lot of the older ones are retiring. And we've, you know, if you're my age, you probably have. <laughs> I yeah, I had, I had that problem. I lost a couple. They, 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 they sent me that my records and retired. 
uh, had a dermatologist and of course they were like the last ones that were going to do well during COVID. So my dermatologist just, Oh yeah, that's yeah. Uh, just threw, threw in, threw in the bag and said, said, I'm moving to Arizona. I'm going to play golf. Here are your records. And yeah. I went, Oh God, now what am I going to do? I got to find a new dermatologist. And you did. Right. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, not I, yet. I, I'm <laughs> it's, I've, I've been to six or seven and I'm not impressed. Yeah. You've got to find one you're comfortable with and, and one that listens. I mean, I could do a whole whole thing on that to, to find someone like, and yeah, to find someone like I have found and, and others have. Yeah, I don't even want to say their name because I don't want them to get too crowded when I have a good doctor. Yeah. I, I and I hear you. I I hear you very very much, <laughs> Doctor Bandler. It's interesting when you said that about dermatology. I hadn't thought about that during COVID. You can't do that on telemed, really. I mean, <laughs> you can't yeah, that ain't gonna happen. They they can't freeze those things off, you know, through the screen. Through the screen. That's yeah. That's that's interesting. I, I had when you talked about that with the lockdown and, and kids, and I read a lot about the effect it's had on on kids, on, on young people, on young students, etc. Talk a little bit more about that, about the impact when they're it, through that growing period. Well, just think. You know, you we 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 understand communication, and a lot of it by facial expression and voice tone. And we do this through experience over time. And when everybody's got their face covered, right? And the weird thing is, is you take one of those masks, right? You inhale a cigarette and you can blow it right through the mask. Yeah. They don't make me feel safe. <laughs> it's a good thing, you know, in Japan, if you get sick, you wear a mask so you don't spread germs, right? right? And we had everybody covered up uh, we had everybody locked down, uh, except in certain places, Florida and Texas uh, didn't lock down as much. But, but even so, we deprived people, we deprived people of, of the opportunity to learn, and, and, and especially younger people who had no experience. So everything became the telephone and the Zoom box, mm -hmm. and it's just not the same. It's not real life. And... Uh, uh, you know, I see younger people sit sitting there, you know, five or six kids, and they're all on their phone looking down. Yeah. Some of them are even texting each other in the room. In the room. Yeah. And, and that means they're missing out on a large part of communication because 90% of the meaning of words is your tone of voice. You can say no and mean yes. You can say, of course, and mean never. You know, because you go, oh, would you go out with me? Yeah, sure. That doesn't mean they're going out with you. <laughs> and it doesn't mean, sure, yes. If you type that, it would be a different communication. And, you know, that the nuance of communication is from the look on your face and knowing who to trust and who not to trust is based on the congruency of communication. When people go, absolutely, it's just not the same as absolutely. And you're shaking for listeners, you're, you're, Taking my head and going back and then up and down, yeah, and up and down. That when you're signaling the opposite of what you're saying, you know, when your voice tone, you know, when people go on, I'm, I'm absolutely certain, and their voice goes up, you know, they're not certain, and you know, we detect that through learning through interaction, and the better you get at it, the better you are as a communicator, and uh, you know, part of that you learn through life. Uh, we teach how to be very precise at it when we teach people to negotiate and things like that. And, uh, but even so, if your kids don't have the foundation of this, it deprives them. And, uh, you know, we know that people, that the emphasis in schools even today, you know, has moved away from the really important things, reading, writing, uh, mathematical skills, you know, all the things that people are going to need to function in this world. And, and, and they're arguing about whether or not they should have silly things around them. You know, the, you know, the stuff, you know, parents want their children to be educated. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of what's been going on is that teachers in college are getting indoctrinated into believing that they know what's better. And they're not looking at the result of their teaching and performance. And it should, you know, it should be measurable 
And the way they measure it by state tests is not the best way to do it. I mean, kids either can do things or they can't do things. I mean, I've had kids that I was told were educationally handicapped and a week later they're spelling and doing math. And that's because I focus on teaching them how to think about it so that they can, and you know, I teach them how to memorize, not just what to memorize. And you know, we've deprived our teachers of the right skills in the schools. So therefore the schools are suffering. And then when you add to it COVID, it's a mess. And we need to get back on track and, and, and have precision in learning. Uh, and, and teachers should become professionals that really care about the quality of the product they produce. And they, should, they need to stop labeling people as, as, as being smarter and dumber and start making everybody as smart as they can. And we need to give them the tools to do that. I wrote the book, Teaching Excellence, and it's virtually not used anywhere, uh, that it hasn't become a part of the, the college education of teachers, and it really should be. Uh, it provides the tools to teach people how to do the hard stuff, spelling, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And if you do all that faster, then you have time for all this extra stuff. Um, to me, uh, I, you know, I think we should all get smarter at everything we do as often as quickly as possible. Uh, Dr. Bandler, when you mentioned that about, about education and uh, teaching excellence is an incredible book that I would certainly urge people uh, to get to read, to absorb and share. The I think about reading, I know in this area, I know across this, this country, uh, reading is, kids aren't reading to what they call grade level. And I had a teacher that I know personally who was telling me about how she had kids in third and fourth grade who were reading at kindergarten level. And I'm not going to use the word forced. She was forced to move them on, but she had to move them up to the next grade. And I'm thinking, so they're going to get further and further behind. And if you can't read in, in 2020, it's 2023. That's right. 2023. It's, I, I, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I know that would be <laughs> But wow, I, I, you know, what, what are we doing? What are we allowing to happen to our, the children of this nation? Well, you know, it's teachers are getting it from every side. The administration is giving it to them. The school boards are giving it to them. The parents are giving it to them. You know, they're, you know that. And there's so much ideology about all of this and very little practicality about it that, you know, that to me, that the grade level of a student is a measure of the teachers and the school. And uh, we need more competition to produce more technology to teach kids to read easier, quicker, faster. And uh, you know, when Kate Benson and I wrote Teaching Excellence, we wanted to help the teachers to do everything in less time because for teachers, 30 or 40% of their time is spent doing administrative work and it keeps going up, satisfying the government. Yeah. Uh, when the federal government and, and things, and, and I, you know, teachers unions are all well and good, but uh, you know, teachers, teachers like everybody else sh should, should be recorded, re rewarded for doing a good job. The best teachers should get the highest pay and that should be measured by the performance of the bottom third of their students getting up to the top third. And, you know, so that we start to develop new ways of teaching so that people don't slip through the cracks all the time. And, you know, while people talk about class size and money, 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 we, as long as I can remember, we've constantly thrown more money at the educational system and gotten less results. And uh, it's not about money, it's about skill. And we have to start changing the way we train our teachers and we have to restructure the schools so that the right power is in the right hands to do the right thing. And this requires that we have some intelligent people making decisions. Uh, that's why I like all these private schools and, and charter schools and, you know, they're trying new things. Some of them will do really well and some of them not so well, and those should fall away. And uh, when we have school choice, that's going to help a lot. 
but we also need for the academicians to get off their ass and start developing real teaching skills instead of just telling teachers to make learning plans, you know, and all this old traditional stuff that's from the 1950s and 60s. We need them to have actually understand neurology and, you know, to do, do what people with great memories do, teach kids to build a memory palace so they can remember whatever they want. And, you know, the imagination is a great tool if it's applied properly. It's, it's you know, it's not just about artistic freedom. When I wrote that book, a lot of very famous people in the field of education slammed it. They went, it's too structured. Well, I'll tell you, structure is a good thing. And if you teach people to read, then they can read what they want. And, you know, if you teach them how spelling is done, they can spell any word. But if you don't give them a good visual field inside their head where they can look at words and, you know, whether it's got seven letters in it or 20 letters in it, it's still just one picture. And all this stuff about measuring by grade levels, uh, I'm afraid in the universe, there is no such thing. You know, you either can do things or you can't do things. And uh, we as parents, you know, and grandparents uh, have to pick up the slack because the school system's not doing it right now. And, uh, you know, if, if your school is failing you, my favorite sentence was, uh, I was at somebody's house and their kid came in all de depressed and down and dragging their feet. And she went, what's wrong, son? And he said, my teacher failed me. And I heard the ambiguity. Wow. That means yeah. that didn't mean the teach kid failed. That meant the teacher failed her, failed to teach yeah. him what he needed to know to pass the test. And it, see, most teachers would say, you're blaming me. And I'm going, no, I'm giving you the chance. If you realize that what you do failed the student, then you can learn something new so that you can do better with that student. Uh, teachers have to be great learners. It can't be a good job just because you get three months off a year and because you could stay home during COVID. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it, the young teachers typically get, don't get into it because that's the way you're going to make a lot of money. They get into it because they love kids, they like being around kids, and they want it. But it gets beaten out of them over the years with all the administrative nonsense and stuff because the focus isn't on accomplishment. And, you know, the, the standard of how well you do is the slowest 10 students in your class are the ones, if you can pull them ahead of the others, then you're doing the right thing. And then the others will explode even faster. And to me, it's all about accelerating learning and making it a joyful experience instead of a tedious experience. Um, which, which, which can be done, and obviously, and is done. Uh, again, Teaching Excellence, one of Dr. Bandler and Kate Benson's uh, books, of course, available everywhere and everywhere online. You're listening to the We Be Free radio show, Brain Free from the Heartland Copyright, Be Free Radio Limited 2023, produced by the lovely Miss Bunny Face in cooperation with White Rabbit Productions. Dr. Bandler, you're good for a few more minutes? I know I've had a couple more minutes, yes. Okay. I just, I want to, when you say that about good teachers, and I, I've mentioned this a lot on the show, now, now I'm talking about over a half a century ago, when I was in high school, I had a junior 11th grade American history teacher who had collected American history books throughout his career. So everyone in the class had a different, that grade level American history book. He would have us read a chapter, let's say on World War II, or what was the cause of World War II, or what was the cause of the Civil War? And he'd go to the Back then they used blackboards. I don't know what they do today, but he would write the different, and it was, it it's, has stuck with me over half a century about how to look at things, not just what it says in the book, who wrote the book, what was their influence. Sometimes I get a little obsessive about that, yet it teachers can really open minds. Again, my example over half a century ago, it sticks with me today. So good teachers can, and by the way, as I always said this, he did not give me good grades. I didn't like him because he was nice to me or gave, gave me good grades. He always said you could do better. <laughs> so, and he was right. Good. You always can do better. Yes, he, and, he was right, uh, absolutely. He taught, he taught you to think yes. rather than what to think. Yeah. And he taught you to ask questions and to look at things from different points of view. And uh, instead of taking one point of view and jamming it down your throat. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
there's a difference between finding answers and and being committed to the right answer. And uh, you know, uh, nowadays the people are so fixated on their ideas that they won't talk to their relatives for God's sake. Uh, yeah, isn't that know. sad? Isn't that sad when you see something about what not to bring up when you're with your family or people that don't based on a political view, the whole idea of unfriending me because you voted a certain way. I, I, in my 70th year, I still love to hear I, for myself say, wow, I never thought about it like that. I still want to be challenged. I still want to challenge my- well, I was told I can't visit my grandson's college because I'm too politically incorrect. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it would just cause him difficulties. Oh. It, you know, I could go into town and stay in a hotel, but that they have so many rules at this college about what's acceptable, and you know, you can everything you do hurts somebody's feeling or triggers them, and what they're doing is making people weak. You know, if if you can't listen to something that you don't believe, I mean, I listen to stuff I don't believe all day long, and you know, and to me, uh, even with the the most schizophrenic of people. Uh, I have to accept that that's a way of looking at the world if I'm going to help somebody to see it differently. And, you know, it has to, you know, everything from one point of view makes sense, right? It doesn't mean that you have to agree with it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't care if people say things to me that I don't believe or don't agree with, uh, you know, because it's them. And it's not all of them. That's just part of them, you know, and your ability to, you know, to be accepting of other human beings means you can accept uh, what comes out of their mouth. It doesn't mean you, just because you hear it, doesn't mean you have to agree with it. And it doesn't mean you have to disagree with it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, often listen to people and will go, that's really interesting, which means, you know, you know, I'm not going to talk about this with you because you're too touchy <laughs> about it. And, and, and and I really don't want to have to come out and go, you bloody idiot. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bannis. When people talk about politics, you know, oh. they keep acting like, you know, you know, one side or the other side is, is more right and has better motives. And I'm afraid I don't trust either one of them. Yeah, I'm with you. Know? you. I, yeah. I agree with you hundred percent, Dr. Bandler. Have you ever wondered where the, uh, empathy where your desire to help where your compassion comes from i have i, I it, it 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 comes from curiosity it comes from the fact that that i like tweaking with things anyway i used to fix old radios people would bring me clocks and radios and i'd take them apart and fix them you know and later on in life it just became something where where when people come in and and you know i i look at it and and to me, I'm trying to figure out how to make it work. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, if I have somebody that's ultra compulsive, I start thinking, well, if they weren't compulsive about, you know, talking to the devil out the window at night and picking hairs off of their arms, they could be compulsive about being joyful and productive. They might, they might make a really great employee. In fact, one of my obsessive compulsives became my secretary great secretary. They worked their <laughs> ass off all the time, but they were, That's I great. got the excessive compulsive to be about answering emails and keeping the mailing list current and all of that stuff instead of stupid stuff about their life and the rest of it, they could relax and live. But I just, I, I like to see things work, you know, and I, I believe that the human brain is so miraculous that, that, that you can, you can take even the most screwed up person and with a few tweaks, uh, they become, a, you know, it becomes something lovely. You know, uh, most people that you meet have their own quirks. Somebody came in the other day and they said, you know, I'm afraid I'm too quirky for anybody to love me. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but there's somebody out there that's going to love your quirks. You know, that, you know, there are billions of people on this planet. When people tell me they can't find one, they're really not looking very hard. I, I would, I would, I would agree, Doctor Bandler. I, I want to say always an honor having you on. Um, and over the years, I'm, I'm so grateful for the relationship. Most importantly, for who you are in the world and the amazing things that that you have done. Again, purenlp.com, uh, richardbandler.com. We've got all the links up everywhere. And I, I 
Again, of course, I love all your books. I love the patterns for problem solving, the new structure of magic. Get it, read it, absorb it, and share that information. I'm grateful. Okay, thank you very much, Louis. I'll talk to you again sometime. Can you stay with me for one minute off air? Okay, one okay. minute off air. One minute off air. Bear with me. Let's make sure I get everything off.